Income Tax 2023-2024, American Opportunity Credit, figuring the credit. Get ready and some coffee because we're going to stop the tax man in his tracks with income tax preparation. All right, maybe we can't completely stop him in his tracks, but we can slow him down. Or maybe we can, like, get off the tracks, you know, before he hits us. Most of this information can be found in pub. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head, allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey's saying. So get one because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Publication 970 Tax Benefits for Education Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. We're at the bottom part of the income tax formula where the credits live. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula is basically a funny income statement ending with taxable income. Therefore, taxable income basically being the bottom line of the income statement part of the income tax formula. But that's only half the battle, half the formula. Then we're going to take that taxable income, calculate the tax on it, not using a flat tax, mind you, but a progressive tax system to get to the tax before credits and other taxes, other taxes, for example, like self-employment tax, if you have a sole proprietorship Schedule C situation. We then have the credits, which are similar to deductions in that they are both good, but if you had a dollar deduction, that would simply decrease the taxable income on the income statement part of the formula, resulting in a benefit not of the full dollar, but dependent upon the tax brackets you're in, whereas if you have the dollar credit, you get the total benefit of the dollar credit if we're talking about these refundable category of credits up top, you have the liability in order to consume it. Otherwise, if the credit gave you a benefit, it would take your liability below zero, making it not a tax, but basically a benefit program, which would result in then the ta total tax. We then apply the payments, like withholdings from the W-2, estimated tax payments, and the refundable credits, these credits can take the tax liability below zero, typically will, will, that's why they're down here in the refundable area, acting like not a tax, but a welfare benefit social safety net program, finally getting us to the tax refund or tax due. This is the form 1098T. Remember when we talk about education expenses, we're typically gonna have to have an institution that's gonna give us a 1098T, which at least tells the IRS that it was an institution that might qualify for the expenses that we can use towards a credit. So we might not have the same exact number reported on the 1098T in the part of our calculation, but we will typically at least have the form that will give us an indication that this is something we need to take into consideration. This is the form 8863 education credits where we can calculate our education credits, the American Opportunity and Lifetime Learning Credits, which feeds into Schedule 3, Additional Credits and Payments, Part Number 1, Non-Refundable Credits, where we have Line 3, Education Credits from Form 8863, and the refundable credits go directly to the Form 
1040 page two. So we have the two categories of credits, the non-refundable flowing in through the schedule C3 on line 20. And then in the payment section, the refundable component, if applicable, for the American Opportunity Credit Line 29 from Form 8863 Line 8. Okay, figuring the credit. So the total amount of the American Opportunity Credit per eligible student is the sum of. So now we're looking at the American Opportunity Credit. That's the larger one of the two. So we've talked about whether we qualify, who qualifies, which return it's going to go on, and so forth. Now we're finally getting to the nitty, to the gritty, calculating the credit. So it's 100% of the first 2,000 of qualified education expenses you paid for eligible student. Now, because of the subsidization of the schools, many times if you were a full-time student going to school, you're going to be paying well over the $2,000 for the entire year. And, and so, therefore, that's a fairly you know, kind of low threshold that you'll get that 100% of the, of the 2,000, again, if you're, if you're paying for a lot of these uh, institutions. So then 25% of the next 2000. So in other words, in order to get the maximum of the credit, then you would expect you would have 4000 of the qualifying uh, expenses that were paid. And you're getting 100% of that first 2000, 25% of the next 2000 to maximize the credit. 100% is 2000, 25% of the next 2000 would be uh, 500. So the max credit would be, then be the 2,500. If you have more expenses over the 4,000, then it might not give you added benefit uh, past that point in time because you've maxed out, maxed out the credit for that one individual student. Now it's possible that you could have multiple students on one tax return. So you're claiming the American Opportunity Credit for two different people, two different social security numbers, for example. Okay, so 25% of the next 2,000 of qualified education expenses you paid for that student. So the maximum amount of American Opportunity Credit you can claim in 2023, therefore, is $2,500 multiplied by the number of eligible students. So if you had multiple kids that are going to school and they're just sucking you dry, of by just going to school and taking taking like whatever weird class that doesn't seem to apply to anything or whatever at least you get a little bit of a credit here per student for the american opportunity credit whereas the lifetime learning credit you might be limited to, to what you can claim per tax return as opposed to per student so you can claim the full 2,500 for each eligible student for whom you paid at least $4,000 of adjusted qualified education expenses. So the maximum expenses, once again, 4,000 per student to maximize then the amount of the credit, maximize per student of 2,500 calculated as 100% of the first 2,000, 25% of the second 2,000. However, the credit may be reduced based on your modified adjusted gross income. So as our income goes up, we have a phase out of the benefit that we get from the, uh, from the credit. So you can see effect on the amount of your income on the amount of your credit later. Example, so Jack and Kay are married and file a joint tax return. For 2023, they claim their dependent child on their tax return. Their modified adjusted gross income is $70,000. Their child is a junior, third year of studies at the local university. Very proud of, of them. Uh, Jack and Kay paid qualified education expenses of $4,300 in 2023. So Jack and Kay, their child, and the local university meet all of the requirements for the American Opportunity Credit. So they're, so they're good in terms of the expenses they qualify and the student being a student and so on and so forth. Jack and Kay can claim a $2,500 American Opportunity Credit for 2023. This is 100% of the 2000 of qualified education expenses plus 25% of the next 2000 up to the 4000 that 300 extra dollars that is being spent is not really giving them an added benefit 
if they just spent four thousand dollars that would be you know that would be the maximum they'd still have the 2500 max for that particular student form 1098t to help you figure your american opportunity credit the student may receive the form 1098t typically they will if they're at a qualified institution generally an eligible educational institution such as a college or university must send form 1098t or acceptable substitute to each enrolled student by january 31st 2024 an institution will report payments received box one for qualified education expenses however the amount on form 1098t might be different from uh, what you paid so note 1098t is a form that you will typically receive if you engaged in education with a qualified institution for qualified education expenses but not necessarily the amount reported on the 1098t is the amount that you might report for the calculation of of the credit because you could imagine different schools having different things required for the payments to the school uh, in other words some schools might have you pay everything just for the tuition versus other schools that might include things like supplies and whatnot in the calculation of the form uh, 1098t uh, so and then we go back to the requirements of what kind of things would qualify for the calculation of expenses that would be that we can take according to uh, that would go towards the credit calculation so when figuring the credit use only the amounts you paid or are deemed to have paid in 2023 for qualified education expenses uh, we also have the situation where if we if we got grants and whatnot then have those been taken into consideration when they give us the 1098 uh, t and do we have to adjust that amount for the grants which sometimes might be reported on another box in the form 1098 t okay in general form 1098 t should give should give other information for that for that institution such as adjustments made for prior years the amount of scholarship or grants so the scholarship and grant situation you will recall if they got a grant and they got free money then then where are we going to know that information well maybe that will be on the 1098t oftentimes as well so it'll be easy for us to basically see what is happening so uh reimbursements or refunds so these are all situations where we've talked about in prior presentations what happens if we have a refund or reimbursement how would we know we had a refund or reimbursements well hopefully that stuff will basically be outlined on the form 1098t uh, and whether the student was enrolled at least half time or was graduate was a graduate student so once again if they were enrolled half time that's one of the requirements so that hopefully will be listed on the 1098t remember why the IRS likes this not just to help you out it's helping them out right because this 1098t went to them as well so if you take the credit and the 1098t says that they didn't go to school uh, half time they didn't fulfill that requirement the IRS is going to basically know that by default right because they got the form uh, as well and were they a graduate student remember one of the requirements for the American Opportunity Credit is that they're in their first four years that's going to be you know freshman junior sophomore senior and so on if they're a graduate student you would think that they've already done the four years and now they're a graduate student so they would not qualify for the American Opportunity Credit but possibly the lifetime learning credit once again this would be in stuff necessary to know reported on the 1098t by you and again by the irs they have that information the eligible educational institution may ask for a completed form w9s request for students or browsers taxpayer identification number and certification or similar statement to obtain the student's name address and tin so now the institution like an employer is forced to give your information to the irs which means they need to know your name your social security number so they can give that information to the irs in the form of the 1098t effect of the amount of your income on the amount of your credit 
All right, so the amount of your American Opportunity Credit is phased out, gradually reduced, that is. If your modified adjusted gross income is between $80,000 and $90,000, $160,000 and $180,000. So that means if you're not married, your income is over $80,000, the benefit is starting to go down from a maximum of $2,500 phasing out, and it phases out fairly quickly up until your income hits $90,000, in which case you lose the credit entirely. If married, we basically have that doubled. So that's kind of somewhat easy to remember the $160,000. And then it's going to phase out entirely at the $180,000. So then you can't claim an American Opportunity Credit if your modified adjusted gross income is $90,000 or more, $180,000 or more if you file uh, a joint return. Modified adjusted gross income, what does that even mean? For most taxpayers, modified adjusted gross income uh, is adjusted gross income, meaning it's your AGI, it's your income minus the above the line deductions or adjustments to income or the Schedule 1 deductions, if you want to see it like that, as figured on your federal income tax return. In AGI, Modified Adjusted Gross Income, when using Form 1040-1040-SR, if you file Form 1040-1040-SR, your Modified Adjusted Gross Income is line 11 of that form, modified by adding back any. So if you have these modifications, this is what the M stands for. Here are the modifications. Foreign Earned Income Exclusion. So whenever we have foreign earned income, that complicates our situation. Foreign Housing Exclusion. Foreign Housing Deduction. Exclusion of income by bona fide residents of American Samoa and exclusion of income by bona fide residents of Puerto Rico. So here's going to be the calculation on the worksheet. So once again, if you don't have those exceptions, it's just basically your adjusted gross income line 11 of the form 1040 phase out. So if your modified adjusted gross income is within the range of incomes where the credit must be reduced, you will figure your reduced credit using lines two through seven of form 8863 part number one. This same method is shown in the following example. All right, let's look at an example. You're filing a joint return and your MAGI, modified adjusted gross income, is $165,000 in 2023. You paid $5,000 of qualified education expenses. You figure a tentative American Opportunity Credit of uh, $2,500. Why? Because you paid over the $4,000. You would think that you would get the max of $2,500, but you have this problem that your income is above the threshold. So there's going to be a phase out situation, which of course tax software is useful. So in practice, what are you going to basically do? You're going to, you can communicate with people by saying, look, there's a maximum of $2,500 per student, which you can maximize out if you pay over $4,000 up to $4,000 will max out the credit, but if your income is above a certain threshold, it will start to phase out and it'll phase out pretty quickly once you go up above that threshold for the AGI limitations. So, and then you can use the software to help you with the nitty gritty if they're within that phase out period typically. All right, but in any case, you figure tentative income of 2,000, 100% of the first 2,000 of qualified education plus 25% of the next 2,000. That's how you calculate. Because your modified adjusted gross income is within the range of incomes where the credit must be reduced, you must multiply your tentative credit, $2,500, by a fraction. The numerator, that's the top part, of the fraction is 180000 The upper limit for those filing joint returns minus your modified adjusted gross income. The denominator, that's the bottom part of a fraction, is $20,000. The range of incomes from the phase out, 160000 to 180000 The result is the amount of phase out reduced American opportunity credit, 1875 So you got the 2500 and then the numerator, 180,000 minus the 165,000 over the 20,000 gives us the 1,875 tax software helps us with that calculation. Refundable part of the credit. So 40% of the American Opportunity Credit credit is refundable for most taxpayers. In other words, if our income is on the low income side of things, then take then we don't have enough tax liability to get the benefit of the credit, then 40% of it uh, is refundable. This will often happen when the student might maybe isn't being claimed by the parent 
but they're doing they're claiming their own credit. They're on their own, possibly, and possibly they're not earning much income because they're going to school at least half time if they're qualifying for uh, the credit. So they might still get a benefit from it, even they, though their tax liability is nil to nothing because there's a refundable portion of the credit. So, however, if you were under age 24 at the end of 2023 and the condition listed below apply to you, you can't claim any part of the American Opportunity Credit as refundable credit on your tax return. So notice that 24, uh, that 24 threshold is interesting because they're ba the idea being there that you might be able to, to take advantage of the credit by being a dependent in that case. And maybe the IRS is basically thinking that, that, that the, the family is going to game the system possibly by, by whether they should be claimed as a dependent or not claimed, you know, as a dependent in certain situations. So instead, uh, your allowed credit figured on form 8863 part two will be used to reduce your tax as a non-refundable credit only. So you don't qualify for a refund if item one, A, B, or C, two, and three below apply to you. So you were under age 18 at the end of 2023 or age 18 at the end of 2023 and your earned income defined below was less than one half of your support defined below or uh, over age 18 and under age 24, in which case you'd still be uh, in the age range where it's possible for you to be a dependent if you were like a full-time student at the end of two th and a full-time student defined below and your earned income defined below was less than one half of your support defined below. So in other words, that would mean that, sh that you might, in for this qualification of the dependency, be able to be claimed as a dependent on someone else's tax return. So at least one of your parents was alive at the end of 2023. So you were filing a joint return as single head of household qualifying surviving spouse or married filing separately for 2023. So again, the basic idea here is that if you were a student, uh, then, and you're trying to get the refundable part of the credit, you may not qualify for the refundable part of the credit if basically you could have been claimed, you know, as a dependent on your parents' tax return that's going to be this bit over here because of your age qualifications uh, and so on uh, and so forth. So that's the general idea. So earned income. So earned income includes wages, salaries, professional fees, and other payments received for personal services actually performed. Earned income includes the part of any scholarship or fellowship grant that represents payments for teaching, research, or other services performed by the student that are required as a condition for receiving the scholarship or fellowship grant. Earned income doesn't include the part of the compensation for personal services rendered to a corporation which represents a distribution of earnings or profits rather than reasonable allowance as compensation for personal services actually rendered. So we're talking, when we think about the earned income situation, we're thinking about income that was earned from our labor generally versus income that's earned as more of a passive situation in investments such as holding stocks and bonds where we're going to get distributions in the forms of dividends and interest perhaps. So if you are a sole proprietor or a partner in a trade or business in which both personal and services and capital are material income producing factors, earned income also includes a reasonable allowance for compensation per personal services, but not more than 30% of your share of the net profits from that trade or business after subtracting the education for one half of self-employment tax. However, if capital isn't an income producing factor and your personal services per, uh, produced the business income, the 30% limit does not apply. Support, what does that mean? Your support includes food, shelter, clothing, medical and dental care, education, and the like. Generally, the amount of the item of support will be the amount of expenses incurred by the one furnishing such support. So we're talking about a support test, basically similar to what you would see when we thought about do they qualify basically as uh, a dependent. 
So if the item of support is in the form of property or lodging, measure the amount of such item of support by its fair market value. However, a scholarship received by you isn't considered support if you are a full-time student. You can see publication 501 for details there. Full-time student, what does that mean? So you are a, so remember this again is basically mirroring the requirements to qualify as a dependent where the age limit could be increased say to 24 if you're basically a full-time student being one of the conditions so you are a full-time student for 2023 if during any part of any five calendar months during the year you were enrolled as a full-time student at an eligible educational institution defined earlier or took a full-time uh, on farm training course given by such an institution or by state counting or local government agency claiming the credit so you you claim the american opportunity credit by completing form 8863 and submitting it with your form 1040 1040 sr we'll take a look at an example of that in software and forms in future presentations hopefully enter the non-refundable part of your credit on schedule three so remember, if you, the non-refundable part of the credit is the part of the credit that you can take if you have enough liability in order to consume it. So it doesn't take your tax liability below uh, zero. And so, it, so in that case, you would file form 8863, and then that would flow through to the schedule three, and then the schedule three into the refund would flow through to the second page of the form 1040 in the non-refundable part. What if you're taking advantage? What if you have the refundable part because your tax liability is going below zero and you're you're going into that refundable component? So you enter the refundable part of the credit on form 1040 or 1040 SR line 29. So in other words, you're filing the form 8863 and the refundable part doesn't go to the schedule three, but directly to page two of the form 1040, not in the in the in the tax area, but rather in the payments area it's alongside with the payment area it has its own basically line in there as we'll see in future presentations in the software example and as we saw in the screenshots of the tax form starting this presentation